Order. Order. Welcome to the Public Accounts Committee on Wednesday, the 8th of May, 2024. Uh, in 2023, the government made the announcement that it would extend funding for childcare entitlements. So a few years ago, it, it, it provided childcare uh, support for three and four-year-olds, and this was extending it to all by the end of by 20, September of next year for all eligible children between nine months and four years old to have 30 hours of government-funded childcare, and in, in, focused on working parents to help them go back to work more easily um, and contribute to the economy. The government set up the programme at speed. This April, um, it relied, it produced um, enough support and funding to get uh, eight, over 800,000 children into um, some of the childcare places, and it's extending that now uh, in uh, September again this year and then to September of next year. Um, it's relying on local authorities and providers to create an extra 85,000 places over the next 18 months. So we want to look at what's happened so far with the current rollout, but also looking forward to see if the government can meet what it's set out uh, to do. I'm delighted to welcome our witnesses. We have Susie Owen, who is the Director and Senior Responsible Owner for the Early Years Programme at the Department for Education, who's a first-time witness here. Uh, she's, of course, joined by Susan Atkins, the Permanent Secretary uh, the, and the Head of uh, the Department for Education, and they're joined by Justin Russell, who's the Director General for Families. So um, welcome. I think, it's, I think, Mr Russell, it's your first time in this guise in front of it us, is, isn't yeah. it? Um, yeah. From a previous role in, in the civil service. And I'm also really pleased to welcome uh, Mr Robin Walker, MP, who's the Chair of our sister committee, the uh, Department for Education Select Committee. So very warm welcome to you. Uh, before we go into the main session, and we just wanted to come, ask a couple of quick questions of um, the Permanent Secretary, and I'm going to ask Mr Walker to kick off. Mr. Thank you, um, Permanent Secretary, good to see you. Um, you'll be aware of the, the BBC reports around um, historical allegations around Whitehaven School and the misuse of um, uh, seclusion rooms, um, that I think they call the calming rooms. Um, clearly safeguarding is a priority for everyone uh, at the DfE. Um, I wonder if you've had a, a, the opportunity to look at the Children's Commissioner's recommendations around providing more detailed guidance on the use of um, such settings uh, and whether you have any comments about any work that might be coming out from that. I mean, I think the main thing to say is that everyone in the department was really shocked by what uh, was shown to be happening in Whitehaven. There is um, uh, a lot of activity going around on around that individual case, but I'm I I'm absolutely um, certain that we should be looking at uh, the guidance that's offered. I mean, I, I don't want to minimise the extent to which uh, some of what was happening was the sort of thing I can't imagine anybody could have thought was okay. So, uh, to some extent, guidance is most useful when you're trying to steer people to do sensible things within reasonable bounds. There are some things where I actually think we need to think about rather firmer measures because people were quite clearly doing something that I, I genuinely can't believe they thought was acceptable. Um, and and I, I, mean, I guess part of the concern there is lack of oversight and engagement with the, the senior leadership team, which obviously you know, we don't know the full details of how much there might have been, but clearly if this is something which is clearly set out, it is something that senior leadership know that they need to be involved with. Yes, and I think that's a completely fair point. I mean, I think, as I say, there's, there are investigations ongoing in, on the circumstances in individual schools, so it's a bit difficult to talk about that in detail. But, I mean, yes, of course, I would clearly expect that any school that was using any provision of that kind, and I mean, I think it should be carefully used overall. The senior leadership should be really closely aware of how it's being used. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ms Ackler, would you talk about firmer um, action? Do you mean criminal? Possible criminal action. As I say, there are investigations going on in relation to that individual case, and I, I mean, I certainly, that's certainly not been ruled out. That's very helpful uh, to hear, and uh, will be hopefully some reassurance to the parents and young people involved. I just wanted to talk a bit about some special educational needs in general. As we've discussed before with you in this committee, and, and many of us will know from our own constituencies, there's a very big increase in the need for special educational needs. In my own borough in Hackney, uh, we're seeing uh, a unit average unit cost rise projected from just under £6,000 in 2022 to over £10,000, 10785 in 2028. But that um, and the, the rise of uh, EHCPs, Education, Health and Care Plans, um, in my borough projected to rise from 3062 to 4751 
between 2022 and 2028. Both those lead to a cumulative deficit of around 180 million in 2028. So that is a huge pressure on local authorities. That's just one London borough um, which is facing that challenge. What are you doing um, in, within Whitehall and in your department and with the Treasury to support council's funding and make sure that the children who need the support they need can get it? Thank you. And I think there's uh, three parts to what we're doing on this. The first is general support for council budgets, because there are, you, you, you rightly describe one source of pressure, but there are other sources of pressure as well. And we've been working very closely with DLUC and with the Treasury, um, and you saw additional resources going into local government budgets at the spring budget as a result of those conversations and the discussions that we have with local government colleagues to understand the pressures there facing across the board. The second thing is the work that we're doing with individual councils that face particularly large deficits related to high needs through the safety valve and delivering better value programmes. Uh, and if you'd like, I'll turn to Justin to talk a little bit more about those in a minute. But we are seeing um, uh, some really good progress from uh, councils. Uh, the, delivering the safety valve programme started a little bit earlier and is a little bit further on, but the delivering better value programme is following on behind that. And in each case, what it does is provide some additional resource, but tied to shifts in the delivery model in the way the council works to try and pull support further upstream and put more um, activity in place that is preventative. And if, if we think, if we turn to the kind of topic of the hearing, one of the things, for example, we're seeing some councils do very successfully is invest more in SEND in the early years, which is having a really, in, in several places, having a really impressive early effect in the number of children being able to be supported into primary mainstream, often without the need for an education health and care plan because they've had the right early intervention. And that's not the only thing that they're doing, but essentially the safety valve and delivering better value funding gives them something to, to manage that difficulty that you often have in investment and prevention, that it's hard to carve out the preventative money while you're still spending on the consequences of not having had it uh, for a while. Um, and we're continuing to pursue that, but we know that it alone won't be enough, which is why we have the SEND change programme that we announced. Um, uh, and we've now got uh, activity running in the nine change programme uh, authorities. And again, Justin could talk a little bit more about this if you'd like, um, where we are trialling the key elements of the overall SEND reform uh, package to give us that kind of bigger and more systemic shift that we know we need in order to address this. Okay, I mean, it's interesting you talk about that early intervention. Yeah. What brings to mind something called Sure Start, which once existed. Um, but you, we know that your, your department's got actually some exemplary projects on evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing to evaluate the work where councils are putting that early years intervention in for children mm -hmm. uh, with special educational needs and analysing what that, that impact is? We've got evaluate. We might turn to Justin. We've got evaluation oh, yeah. programs around both safety value and delivering better value, and plan for the change program. Mr. Russell. So, with the delivering better value program, which I think has been operating around 54 local authorities, part of the package of support to local authorities is the provision of expert advice on special educational needs, where a team will go in and help the local authority analyse its population of children with special needs, and the provision being provided to them. It, uh, the specialist will talk to parents, they'll talk to staff working in these facilities and they will map existing provision and make suggestions as with, with the agreement and consultation with parents as to how that uh, should be improved. And, and they will also look at over time at whether the improvement plan that results in that diagnostic process does, does lead to improved services for children, leads to, to shorter waiting times for specialist help, leads to improvement in, in mainstream provision. And I think a big part of the answer to this is about improving the ability of mainstream primary schools, secondary schools and nurseries to support children with special needs as soon as they, they develop. And we, when we know from the profile of children with special needs that as young as two years old you can start to spot developmental delays, particularly in speech and language, and the, the sooner you can get that specialist support in the more you're likely to prevent uh, more that, serious well, I mean, problems that's all. Developing. I mean, I don't doubt the theory, but how are you actually evaluating what the impact is of the expertise and the money that's going in to support that early development, early intervention to prevent problems down the well, line? Uh, as I said, within each of the 54 areas, we are tracking exactly what, what's happening with the, with the children with special needs in those areas in terms of the numbers that require SEND support or require... Well, it's, tracking, it's tracking slightly different to a wider evaluation because yeah. <clears throat> you know, that's individuals being tracked, but it, there's still got to be some systemic 
policy, well, one would hope it might lead, if it works, to a systemic policy change. So, I mean, maybe Ms. Ackland, you're the person to answer this, that, are you, because you've told us before, you know, evaluating properly is a rounding yep. error in a budget. So have you got, a, a, is that all going to be pulled together, all that data that's been tracked, so that you've got a really good picture of what's working and what's not? Yes, and we've got that, and um, we, we, we have, so as I said, because Safety Valve is smaller but a bit further ahead, we've already got the kind of summative um, work from the first round of Safety Valve, look, pulling together that analysis of what people have done, what's been effective and what hasn't. We've also, I also mentioned the change programme work, and that's essentially, that's designed as um, uh, a piece of work to kind of test and track uh, early implementation of that set of propositions from the main send them because that's it, as it were inherently got evaluation built into it because that's the purpose of it if that makes okay. sense because i mean it's not because not just um, evaluating what happens to those young people but the longer term is what that it has impact on school budgets yep. on attainment more widely and therefore i mean all sorts of, i mean it, yep. you could you could draw it quite wide but you're at the moment you're really sticking to the, the young people involved and what the impact on them we are looking at the impact on school and local authority budgets yeah, as well okay. as part of that. Okay. Okay. Um, just I mean, safety valve and the value both important programmes which do some very good work. Um, but the slight frustration I think has been that they both continue to expand because more local authorities need them. Uh, do you have any examples of local authorities that have come out of those programmes or re removed their deficits um, as a result of support from them? Yes, I think I'd have to write to you to give you the list of names, but we do have a group of authorities that have removed their deficits as a result of engagement. Uh, reduced or removed? So, yeah. We've got, we've got, we had, we do have some who have removed. Okay. I think certainly in relation to so. delivering better value, we are basically at the, at the end of the first stage, which is the diagnostic stage, and now into the implementing the plans resulting. So I think it's a bit early to see the the impact of the actual implementation plan in those delivering better value. Uh, areas, but we should start to see that over the next year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. rather than start discussing who might be in that list has come off uh, having a deficit, we'd love to see the information uh, both committees if that's okay. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, this leads to the point really about the statutory override for the dedicated schools grant. If my borough of Hackney has got a potential liability of 880 million by 2028, yet the statutory override for the dedicated schools grant finishes in 2025-26. Now, there's a, a deadline that's ever been chased. Often there's a the department rides to the rescue with the Treasury on this, but can you explain what's going to happen um, or with the statutory override for the dedicated schools grant? Be, whether you can give us any assurance after 25 26? I can't at this point give you any assurance after 25 26, like everything else on that. Okay. Time it is true that every time, every time it's nearly happening, there is, a, there is a, a, an override, isn't there? So far, there has what, never been a time when it's actually crystallised. What has happened so far is that, I mean, I think everybody accepts that it's not an idea, that, that having the override is not ideal and that we would like to get to a place where we don't have it. But I think everybody also recognises that the simple removal of the override doesn't solve the underlying no, problem okay. and that people have got to recognise the reality. And there's a huge, I mean, that's a huge deficit, as I say, for one London borough. So it's not really sustainable. So are you, conf are you saying to us that the work that you just described is going to reduce these budgets and budget deficits as big as that. So as I say, we have got examples through safety valve of councils that have reduced and in some cases removed their deficit okay. through the work of they've done. Of a scale of 180 million? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, but, uh, yeah. but, but the combination of that work and the larger, more systemic work we're doing through the change programme is... is is how we propose to get to the point where we okay. no longer need statutory override. Sounds like we can have a whole other discussion, and I know our sister committee has been doing good work on this, so we will, we will pause that uh, for now. And we want to talk, of course, about the um, important uh, work extending childcare entitlements for working parents uh, in England. I should stress this only covers England, not Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. Um, and it was very fast. Um, the National Audit Office has given you some credit for getting it out off the stocks at the pace that you did. Um, but given the speed, Ms. Ackland Hood, that you did it, can, how did you ensure your, assure yourself as accounting officer that the rollout at that pace was feasible? So, um, I mean, as always with a programme of this size, and, and actually the first thing I want to say is... Uh, is to, is to say thank you to local authorities and to childcare providers, childcare and early years education providers up and down the country, and also to the team in the department who have worked really hard on this, uh, because um, I'm, I'm really proud of what we did for the first stage of the rollout. Um, uh, we delivered what we said we were going to do, actually possibly slightly more, um, and we're seeing a large group of children and parents who've got access to 
good quality childcare um, uh, and are having costs met that they would have had to pay um, for themselves. Um, the, as the NAA report sets out, um, we staged the rollout of the programme quite carefully to try and get the right balance between getting these benefits to children and parents as quickly as possible, which is, a, I think, a, a good thing to seek to do. And, I mean, certainly when you look at the kind of challenges that are there at the moment on both affordability for parents, um, ability for parents to make the choices they want to make about uh, work and care in those early years. So we've got a lot of survey evidence that there are a lot of parents who say that they would like to... Yeah. Uh, work or work more if they had access yeah. to childcare. Yeah. So we, we know, I, we know all that. It's just, yeah. Yeah, so. I don't think it was unreasonable to try and do it quickly, I think is what I'm saying, because the benefits are so great to so many people. But we wanted to stage it in a way that combined pace with feasibility. And that's why you see the, the, the rollout that begins with um, the two-year-old offer that we made this April and then moves on to a wider offer from nine months from this September of 15 hours for working parents and then goes further by September 2025 to offer 30 hours to working parents of nine to, um, uh, well, to three and four-year-olds when you take into account all of the offers. And um, so the, that, that phasing was a kind of really key element in making sure that it was feasible as well as fast. Um, and in terms of the sort of process of assuring myself, I did what I would do with any programme of this size. Uh, I appointed some really excellent people um, uh, and we made sure that we had a set of systems and processes in the department uh, using, again, just good project and programme management principles to set ourselves up well to make sure that we had, for example, the sort of stage gates around it that you would expect to see. And I stayed personally relatively close to it as I do with kind of large programmes across the department. And I also used the formal mechanisms that we have available to us. So um, it took you six months to provide your accounting officer assessment. Why, why, why so long? Because it's useful for us to see what you're thinking about this. Yes, um, and, uh, and I mean, the, the, the accounting officer assessment I see as a sort of process as well as a piece of paper. So there were drafts of the accounting officer assessment alongside the outline business case, which is, again, our normal practice and what we'd expect to do. We then had a bit of kind of toing and froing the other side of the outline business case about some of the elements included. So it was less on feasibility, actually. It was more on the detail of some of the um, uh, business case and value for money assessment. At no point was I worried that there wouldn't be positive value for money, so it was all in the realm of being good value for money. But again, you can see some of this described in the NA report. There was a set of conversations about whether or not it was reasonable to score the leisure benefits to parents and some kind of to and froing on that. And essentially, we just waited till that debate had settled before we published the accounting officer assessment. OK, um, just, you had to obviously having to make quite potential trade-offs um, and you've got a lot of risk at the pace at which you're going to be doing it. So you've got the next stages to go. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe, maybe Ms Owen could come in, in here. We like to have first time witnesses get something to say. Um, uh, so... Yeah, what trade-offs did you? What what trade-offs are there? So what what's not? What what are you having to not do, in order to make sure that this goes out, on the top the rapid timetable between now and next September or September next year? Yeah. So just building on what um, uh, the Permanent Secretary said, well, the way we phased the rollout was very focused on what was deliverable in the timeline. So that the first year it was very important that we could put the legislation in place, we could make sure the funding allocations were confirmed and out. Um, and that the systems that parents would access would be available, which was about the places. Of it. What about the availability? Of yes. Places? So, so, so that was the priority. That was the, that was the pace for the first year because mm. the place creation is, is very backloaded. So, it's September 2025, which is where we need to see the growth in both workforce and in and in places. But as you'll see from uh, reported in the NA report, that's that's steep towards um, yes, 20, yes. Uh, September 2025, but not so much for the April 24th. Uh, 24 rollout that we've just had and for September that's coming. Um, that was to give the sector as much time as possible to, uh, to, to build ahead to that. Um, the things that are really important to give certainty and confidence to the market to invest is obviously the funding rates uh, and ensuring that we set those at the right level to incentivise investment over that period. And particularly important, um, as we heard as we spoke to the sector through the first um, year of, of rollout, was providing certainty beyond 
uh, uh, this year of what that, those rates would be. So that was confirmed at spring budget this year, which um, uh, has been roundly welcomed by the sector in terms of giving that certainty for 25, 26 and 26, 27, so that they know and they can plan and therefore make, make, make that available. The other thing that we've done um, is to work really hard to ensure that our estimates around supply and demand are, are good and robust, so that we're looking at what's already available in the sector, the capacity of the sector, where that capacity exists, and where the demand will be um, as the rollout um, moves through. We've done lots of supply and demand mapping on that. We share all you of mean that. geographical mapping? Yes, mm -hmm. exactly, down to ward level. Yeah. Um, and we share that with we'll local authorities. We'll come to that in more detail. Okay. <laughs> and we share that with local authorities, cross-check it with their assessment, make sure that we're, we're, we, we are... Um, uh, talking about the same thing, so that people know where they need to target that growth and where that growth might be coming from. We've got 84,800 places to get for end of next year, and that will include baby room spaces, which are always more potentially mm. more challenging to create. So what risks are there between now and September? What's, what's, what, what worries you at night that you're not, you, know, you might not get across this line? I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge task you've been set. So it was not a criticism, but it might be difficult to deliver. Yeah, so I think the, the place creation and the workforce, mm -hmm. obviously, are the biggest, as, as the NA, NA report highlighted, are our, our biggest challenges. So on the workforce side, it's ensuring that we have the good supply routes in, that we have the training schemes there to pass forward that as much as possible. We've also done quite a lot to look at provider flexibility and how they deploy their workforce. So thinking about um, where you need the entry points into the sector to help ensure that workforce is there. So we've done lots of thinking, and that was done very much in consultation with the sector over last summer, of the things that they would find most useful and most helpful. Can you give us an example? <coughs> yes, sure. So when, when the way we regulate the sector, we regulate the sector through the early years foundation stage framework that sets the minimum requirements, and particularly around staffing um, qualifications. So we've made some changes to that to allow greater flexibility. So for example, um, we are now allowing, if you are studying towards a level three qualification, but you're already a level two practitioner, if the manager deems it appropriate, that person can act as a, a level three um, a member of staff to count in ratios, as we call it, because you need to have a level three. That's what unlocks, unlocks the ratios. Obviously, we changed the uh, ratio requirements for two-year-olds back in September to allow uh, one member of staff to look after five children rather than four children, again, to give a bit more flexibility for how um, uh, uh, providers deploy staff. And we've also um, changed the maths requirement on which previously all level three practitioners had to have a GCSE or a level two functional maths qualification. We've moved that requirement up to the manager of a setting um, uh, because we knew there were lots of level three very capable, very confident, very experienced practitioners who couldn't operate at level three level because they did not have that maths requirement. So we made that, that change as well. Okay, I mean, if, you, if you're being uncharitable, as you could say, so it's a pile them high, teaching with less qualified people approach to ed early years education, what would you say to that? I would say, are you reducing quality, basically, by changing those ratios? We, we've spent a lot of time over the last few years um, investing in quality in the sector. So in 2021, we reformed the EYFS, the learning development requirements, to really focus on quality teaching. And we know that the things that matter uh, in an earlier setting is those interactions between the adult and the child. And there's lots of different ways. Qualifications are one proxy for, um, uh, for quality, but they're not the only one. And that we know that managers, what we heard from the sector is managers are best placed to know which of their staff are best able to be deployed. And they felt that the requirements that we placed on them were a bit too restrictive. So they were making decisions based on ticking the box in the regulations rather than on deploying staff in the way that they felt was best uh, needed to, to meet the needs of those children. So all of the changes that we made, as I say, were, were made in consultation with the sector and were things that the sector had asked us for, so we're, we're confident. Um, uh, and that's presumably changed the inspection regime to take, uh, that's going to have to change to take account of this? Ofsted yeah. inspect on the basis of yeah. the UIFS, so yes, okay. that, that, that's and so, in place. And, that, and you had to you obviously discuss that with Ofsted. Yeah, we have a statutory duty to consult okay. with. We'll come back to some of those points, but thank you very much for your fulsome um, and clear answers. Thank you. Mr. Walker. Uh, thank you, thank you. I should have said at the start, thank you very much for having me uh, to guest on the committee. Um, I, my reading, some of the synopsis of the NAO report is, is so far so good, but a lot of risk stored up in the firm stages. And, and you yeah, know, that's quite a good outcome, really, um, at this stage in the process. But it is, um, there's definitely a lot of emphasis on, on the risks as we go further. Um, what's your conclusions in terms of the balance of where the expansion has come to date? And is it, does it reflect the, the size of the, the, the breakdown in the market that existed before this in terms of across nurseries, childcare settings, private and voluntary sector, um, uh, schools, and childminders? Are there any surprises in the way it's played out to date? And are there any changes you need to make in order to make sure that this succeeds at the next stage? 
So predominantly in the under three market is in the PVI part of the market, so that's the private, voluntary and independent institutions, which includes childminders. It's not so much in the school-based, although in recent years we have seen schools expand into two-year-olds particularly, um, but it's predominantly in that bit of the market, so that's where we would be expecting to see the growth because that's where the provision currently is. Um, we'll, be, when we, we'll be conducting a census this term, which will be counting exactly the number of children that are, that are in a place, and that's when we'll know exactly where those children are, so we'll be able to make that assessment at that point to see, see where the growth needed for this point in the rollout was very modest, so we don't expect to, to see a significant um, shift at this point. Um, uh, it will be the future rollouts where you, you'd expect to see that more, but it'll be when we get the data um, that will enable us, us to see. But we're, we're, we're very pleased, obviously, with the amount of uh, children, as, as the permit secretary um, uh, noted, that have already been confirmed as in a place, so that shows that many providers are willing and uh, uh, keen to offer the entitlement and have been able to convert predominantly parent-paid places into government-funded places for this, this first uh, phase of the rollout. And, and in terms of the um, impact on other existing offers, has there been any um, impact on the pre-existing two-year-old offer for disadvantaged children? Have numbers for that held up and uh, have they been effective in any way by this rollout? So again, probably too early to say because this has just happened, we've not done the count yet, but um, we, we were at the highest level we'd ever been at for the disadvantaged two-year-old offer. That was at 74% in January 2023, recovered really well post-COVID. 74% of eligible. Of the eligible population, exactly. Um, we'll be keeping a close eye on that. The way we've designed the funding formula is to take into account that disadvantaged offer, and we've been really clear with local authorities that the priority is to ensure both the disadvantaged offer, the universal three- and four-year-old offer that exists, you know, um, are maintained and their duty on sufficiency is across all of the entitlements, just not, not just the new one. So we'll be keeping a really close eye on that um, when, we, when we look at that data coming through uh, and see how that's changed. Thank you. Also, just in our inquiry that we did on the Education Committee, we heard from a lot of providers and from parents groups that um, even if the government changed the rules on the um, two-year-old ratios, that they wouldn't necessarily follow through on them. Has that been the experience, um, or, or, or are you observing that those, those different ratios are being taken up uh, on large scale for two-year-olds? Yeah, well, I've got the numbers, um, uh, but I think ahead of the, um, so we, we can, when we, we did a survey of providers prior to introducing the change, um, and I think it was about um, low 20% of providers said that they would make that change. We did another survey in November that was published just recently, the results of that was published just recently, which confirmed actually a higher proportion, so I think it was just over 30% of providers have actually moved to the, to the new ratios at, for, for points. And one of the rationales behind it was not necessarily that you would operate at one to five all day, every day, but that you had that flexibility to use it. So if you needed to, so you didn't have to shut down a room or close because you didn't have the staff, you had a bit more flexibility to deploy that at certain times of the day if that's what worked for your setting. And, and finally, we made a number of recommendations, obviously, some of which go beyond the scope of the DfE, and I make no apology for that because this is obviously an area of cross-government working. Um, are you, is there an ongoing dialogue with DWP and the Treasury on what would make this policy work most effectively, particularly when we look at other policies such as universal credit, tax-free childcare, uh, and tweaks to that which could drive take-up? Yes, absolutely. And <clears throat> not only are we looking at that for the future, but we're, I mean, what, one of the things that we were really pleased about is that in the spring budget announcement that was made that launched this offer, uh, there were also some really important changes made to the universal credit childcare offer. Uh, first, to increase the threshold for the amount that can be claimed. Second, to move to payment in advance. And we'd heard from parents that one of the biggest barriers to being able to use and take up that universal credit childcare offer was that it was paid in arrears and that people didn't have a cash flow to pay ahead. And we, on this, we work really closely across DWP and the Treasury because we see this, it, we see the importance of recognising that this is one system that needs to work sensibly together. And we as DFE will never do that thing where we sort of argue for the bit that happens to sit within our boundary rather than the, looking at kind of what we think is going to give the greatest benefit. So we, we, we were advocating incredibly hard alongside... DWP colleagues for that change being part of that package and we're really happy that it came about because again making sure that there's a really good offer for children up and down the the income spectrum is really important. Thank you very much for now Mr Walker. Um, Sarah on the MP. Thank you Chair. Um, Ms Owen, uh, 
One of the things uh, that the report's picked up is that um, you scrapped plans to do a pilot of the rollout. Um, now, when there was a, uh, an expansion back in 2017 to enable entitlement to the parents of three- and four-year-olds, um, the DfE said that testing was a critical success factor in making that work um, and that rolling out a new programme without a proper test would actually be a significant risk. And yet the planned test or pilot was, in fact, abandoned. Um, can you talk us through that decision? Yes, of course. <clears throat> so as you rightly say, back in 20, uh, 2017, it's when 2017. 30 hours were rolled out, we, uh, there, were, there were two pilots that, that ran ahead of full rollout. So it was right that we looked at that really seriously for this programme, um, given it had worked really well. But there's some fundamental differences between the two rollout, which has meant that we, in the end, decided that that wasn't necessary. So particularly the phasing. So in 2017, when we rolled out um, 30 hours, it was done as sort of one big bang. So the, the, the systems came online all at the same time, the, the, the hours for the parents parents and there was a lot going on in that first term of rollout in 2017 it was a new system it was the same time tax-free childcare was also being rolled out at, at a similar time so there was quite a lot of risk built into that as we've already discussed the way we we, we phase the the program means that we've we will have done all of the system changes well ahead of the final rollout so most of the parents that are in the system will be already be in the system when it comes to september 25 they may be increasing their hours there will obviously be, be new parents coming in as their children age in and if parents choose to to uh, move back into work, um, but, but the, the system is known to parents, it's known to providers, um, it, it will have been used, and obviously also we're, 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 we're phasing in in terms of the hours uh, needed, so we, we, it is already a different beast, which meant that, it, that that wasn't the appropriate thing to do. The other thing it was worth considering was, because of the pace that we've already talked about, um, we would have been asking LAs to do that very quickly, to introduce that, that, that 30 hours, which meant you would have had to select a particular group of LAs who were able to do that, which means that your testing doesn't necessarily give you as rich information, because ideally you want to test in a range of, of situations, scenarios, etc. So, so you, you could have caught yourself picking the, the low-hanging fruit in terms of that rollout, which means then you're not really testing the, um, uh, the, the full rollout. So there were a variety of reasons that it was it was looked at very seriously um, for all the reasons that you set out that it was it was very useful in 2017 but ultimately and um, the decision was taken that it wasn't appropriate for this program okay um, what what risks do you think um, the program has experienced as a result of not having uh, an early testing uh, and I, I totally understand everything you're saying that you're you've prioritized doing it at speed and, and you know the need for that's been recognized but what have been the risks of not having a test? Uh, a test set of LAs to kind of draw from? So if we had done testing, we wouldn't have started until September or January anyway because we'd be, we'd be testing the full yes, 30 hours rather yeah. than the 15 hours. So I don't think at the moment there is anything that we haven't done that we wouldn't have done anyway right. because of the phase we are in the rollout. Yeah. Obviously, the key thing that you're not testing is that market growth and the ability to absorb that. So that will be the thing that we need to make sure we're really on top of in the next 18 months in terms of the plans mm -hmm. that local authorities have where that, that growth is needed, um, what plans they have in place to meet that growth, their dialogue that they're having with their providers, how they're supporting providers to be able to expand, etc. And, and that our whole programme is built around that, that close working with local authorities to really understand what they're doing, how they're working with their local provider base, to know where that growth is needed and what, what they are doing to, to address that. I suppose, given it's still only just about the first week of May, it's a little bit early to ask you what the lessons are learned from the April 2024 rollout have been any anything early that's kind of emerged as you can imagine on a program like this we are <laughs> we're learning all the time so no i think that's a, it's a great question to ask i think first of all obviously we, we are pleased with how well it's gone um uh there's, there was a lot of concern about the pace when it was first announced and our ability to to do that i think the things that we've learned is that providers have welcomed the fact that we've used existing systems so they understand how the childcare service works. they understand how parents access and get a code that's all worked well um, we did have an issue when we um, uh, uh, opened the childcare service in, in January for a particular subset of parents um, who were already accessing tax-free childcare and couldn't, couldn't reconfirm in the right window to get their code and that, that window was going to take a bit longer. We've addressed that for the, the opening on the 12th of May, so there's quite a few lessons we've learned in terms of how we communicate with parents about that opening date, how we make sure they can those parents that are still affected by that issue will be issued a, a letter which gives them a code um, uh, by the end of May so that they can use that code if they, if they choose with their provider. So there, there was quite a lot of uh, learnings around that and making sure parents really understand what the offer is um, and, and how to access it. 
Um, we also, <clears throat> because of the pace, we, we, we didn't have as much support in place for local authorities in the rollout for this, so we're very much using those lessons, uh, learning how what, what local authorities need, putting that place in support as early as possible, and not just for September 24, but actually looking ahead to September 25. So when we worry about a local authority, we don't just worry about the next milestone. We're, we're saying, yes, well, how are you gearing yeah. up for the future? And we now have a support contractor in place um, who can then provide that support to local authorities. So plenty of rich learning already. As you say, we're only, only five <laughs> weeks into the term, so there'll be more, more to come um, uh, uh, soon as well. And you don't think there's anything uh, you, of the lessons learned from the rollout so far that you think would have been picked up by a pilot and fixed before a, a larger rollout? It's hard to say, because mm. the trade-off, I suppose, the yeah. chair's question earlier, was pace over perfection, yes. I suppose. And that there was always going to be that trade-off. Yeah. So I suppose the, the other thing we did learn, which we, which we are addressing for next year, was the, the time it takes between government confirming what a local authority's rate will be and then the local authority setting those rates locally for providers and that that mm. caused quite a lot of anxiety for some mm. providers yes. that they felt that it was quite late to know so we're reviewing the way we do that for future years we're reviewing the the, the length of time between government confirming what the, the the local authority rates will be and then how those translate into final rates for providers because understandably um, that is a cause con for concern so i think there are things like that um that, that we're definitely learning that we can implement already for, for next next year but as i say it would have been that, that trade-off between pace and, and as Susan's already said, the, the priority was to ensure that parents were feeling this as quickly as possible and we believed it was deliverable to get that first 15 hours out to, to, two, to two parents of two-year-olds by April and that, I think, is a greater benefit right. than what we might have learned from going, going slightly slower. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you, for now, uh, as only Olivia Blake, MP. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Ms Ackland Hood, um, what assurances can you give us that every parent who did want a place in early years um, from April 24 managed to get one? Thank you. So, um, first of all, uh, we have a system working with local authorities where they will tell us if they have a sufficiency problem. In other words, if they have parents who want a place who can't find, find one. And we've had no local authority report to us a sufficiency concern for April 2024. It's really difficult to guarantee that there isn't a parent out there who couldn't find... So, so what I suspect there will be is parents who couldn't get the place they wanted in their, in their top mm. choice of nursery. I, I'm fairly confident that probably happened for quite a lot of people because that is a feature of a system in which there's um, choice and variety and you don't force people to have more places in their nursery than they have. Um, I can't guarantee that there won't be a parent out there who didn't find any place they wanted and didn't tell their local authority and therefore their local authority didn't tell us. Um, but uh, we had, as Susie has said, quite good down to ward level mapping of the existing places in the system, the places where we had spare capacity and the places where we were worried about it and we were working really, really closely with the local authorities, again, t having conversations literally at the kind of this particular bit of the town centre had a nursery that is closed and we're worried about it okay what should we do about it type level mm. so um th that we 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 didn't see any local authority that said to us they had a difficulty and then when we look at the codes put out and claimed uh, we um projected that we would be so again we know, based on the rollouts of the three- and four-year-old offers that we've seen over time, mm. that we won't see literally every code that is claimed 85 validated. And we, we said, if we could get to 85%, that, that looks like effectively full take-up when you take into account people who change their mind or do something a bit different or find a grandparent or, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, we reached that 85% level in the figures that we put out yesterday. And... We also said that we would expect to be at something more like 70% in that kind of very first week because we know it takes providers some time to come back and validate the code. So again, I'm sorry about the language of validation, but basically we issue codes which give parents something to take to a provider. If they go to a provider, get a place and are paying for it, the provider then validates the code. So I've heard some commentators say, oh, this validation thing doesn't mean people have got a place. It literally does mean people have got a place. You cannot get a code validated if you haven't got a place because the provider has to validate the code to say 
they're claiming the money for the place you're in. So there are 211... At that point, you know you've got a real yes. child in a real in place. Yes. So there are 200, just a little bit over 211,000 children out there in a place being paid for by the new entitlement who have definitely found a place that they were seeking out of 247,000 parents who are roughly who originally claimed yeah. a code, and that's 85%. And that's yeah, the figures are all laid out in the report, yeah. so don't need to... And that, and that we are, we are yeah. really confident and comfortable about that. And, and we, we expected that based on what we knew about the level of capacity that, that's in the system. And one of the things people don't always remember in this conversation is that we've seen um, uh, a growth in place numbers since 2018 of something in the order of 40,000 places based on our provider survey. Uh, over that same period, the population of 0 to 4 year olds has reduced by 200,000. Mm. Yeah. So we, we, we've got a demographic decline in this age group going on. And that's one of the reasons why providers are sometimes finding it quite difficult at the moment because the population of children is going down. Yeah. But in terms of spaces in provision, it's actually not a bad time to be expanding your offer because there is some capacity being created by the demographic change. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just ask well, just for a moment on the demographic change as you mentioned that um, when we've looked at this before with school places in this committee many years ago the DfE was saying local authorities have a responsibility for that the local authorities thought that the DfE had a responsibility for that and nobody seems to take responsibility for the demographic challenges which we see mm. well, in, we were discussing actually earlier in London massive re massive reduction in the need for school places at the moment because of lots of reasons, cost of living, housing, and in other areas of the country, a boom in younger people. So when that, you look at that demographic change, have you got a sense of where that's happening geographically and how granular can you get? Yes. So for, the, for, the, for that population of 0 to 4, as we build that demographic change into our modelling, and as Susie says, we do supply and demand modelling at ward level, which takes into account... But down to ward level in yes. every local authority. Right? Yes. So we take into... I mean, you, you, have to, you have to take into account that you can't directly predict in which ward someone... Who, so if someone lives in one ward, it's a bit difficult yeah. to work out yes, whether they're yeah. going to want childcare in the same ward, the ward next door. So there's a little bit of kind of fuzzy yeah, edges. Yeah. But we can do the demographic modelling based on where people... Just thinking of the ward, don't you get to small sample challenges if you've got... Was it? I can't, sorry, the figure you gave was uh, for that couple of hundred thousand, wasn't it? For the, the drop in not to four years. Two hundred thousand. Yeah, that's what I said. So, but by the time you break that down to ward level, you might be getting quite small numbers in some areas. So you, you've got robust modelling though that proves that this is. So, so we look both valid. at the demography and we look at um, uh, uh, family income and the and the entitlement and at take up of the existing entitlements and between the three of those that gives us a pretty good picture and again we assume that there will be a little bit of movement across ward boundaries so it's not people aren't people aren't restricted to the provision that's in there but, but you we also I mean more broadly as a department you are you've got a good sight of that changing need for that that age cohort and where there might be areas of pressure as we've seen in London schools where we're seeing secondary schools with very low roles now and primary school classes closing Yes. certainly in the central London area, massively. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, it happened perhaps without, not without planning. It, it, it wasn't immediate, it wasn't obvious five years ago that that necessarily would have been the case. Well, yes, and I think that, I mean, the, 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 the particular London challenges at school level have been um, the, how, how the kind of birth rate translates into the school age population is quite heavily affected by families that move in yeah, and out yeah. of area. Yeah. In that kind of yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't, I'm trying. Yeah, I'm not sorry. diverting on schools. What I'm being saying is, so yeah. how good is your modelling on each age group, and 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 what could be improved? Because so we, our modelling, our modelling is, our modelling is pretty good. But like all modelling, it's much better at modelling reasonably gentle trend than yeah. discontinuous yeah. change. So I think one of the things that happened in the school age population was that we saw some sh some quite interrupted patterns, yeah. particularly around the oh, pandemic. Weird, yeah. Um, and uh, so we, but what we what we are confident about is that when we see something that isn't expected, we notice it. Okay. I think on the on the on well, the, the early years, so there's under, not under fours. You think you've got a good yes. handle on it. Okay. Yes, and I think that on the, on the who's responsible. It, again, it's worth noting that the kind of the, the setup of the early year system is a bit different. So it is it's a it, it is a, a market driven system where we allow really e even more kind of parental choice than than in the 
school age system and because we've got no restriction on market entry or exit yeah. So we can anyone can set up a nursery if, as long as they're qualified and they meet the regulations. Okay. Whereas we don't. Just, just a very quick one on this specific point. Is the um, in the announcement that the minister made to the house on this, there was a mention of a pilot to look at using school buildings to yes. um, provide. Yeah. Can you give any more detail of that, the scale of it, and, and is that something that you think might be able to be scaled up in future spending reviews if it if it is a success? Yeah. So we've got. So you might want to talk about this. We've got a pilot Sorry. running over the summer, which is looking at finding. Um, uh, school buildings with surplus capacity and putting them together with PVR providers who want more space. Um, and uh, we think that's a really interesting thing to do. And if it's successful, we definitely would look at um, how it could be expanded. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, it's relatively small scale, but um, we've done exactly almost as you've described. We've taken the school age population and, and looked at the correlation between the growth needed um, in our. Uh, uh, because of the rollout and where school population is, is decreasing so that we can see how that maps and there is a loose cor correlation there so we can then target use that to target so what we've done is at, again at ward levels picked a few wards where that correlation is strong so you need de uh, you need demand you need growth on the earlier side and you've got a uh, surplus capacity of the school system and we're testing how the best ways of doing that whether that's the school extending their provision down or as Susan says partnerships with PBI. You're looking for a school to schools to pilot this in, in the next <coughs> few months basically. Yeah, we're doing that over the summer. Yeah, we're doing that over the summer. Can I just ask how, how public is your data on, on the modelling? Is it is it public information? On the on modelling of under four, well, all of the modelling we just talked about, the, the, the demographic modelling for young people. Um, we use we'll draw on MNS modelling on the demographics, which is public. Okay. Yeah. You put that through your own modelling, basically. Yes, okay. and we'll put it together. Okay. No, that's just helpful, though, because. Okay. There's a big, big issue, particularly in London at the moment. Uh, just back to the sorry, just, Blake, is that if I may, Chair, I'm sorry. One, just one more thing. I think the other thing that's worth saying is, as well as us doing that piece of work on that pilot, we are also seeing schools themselves yeah. um, expanding their yes, nursery provisions yes, significantly. significantly. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you yeah. look at the the change in um, what are, you, are you referring? What are you referring to? A chart in the report. Sorry, I'm looking at the number of registered places in England according to our childcare and years provider survey from 2023, which again. Okay, so this is we, sorry, it's information we, we haven't got in front of us. We'd so be happy to yet. share. If you could share it with um, us, yes. But was gonna, all I was going to say was you 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 see some of the greatest <coughs> growth yeah. among school-based providers, particularly yes. in recent years. So there's well, a lot of school-based providers who are growing their early years provision, including yeah. moving down. Yeah. I, I wish we know, and we're, 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 we're focusing on, on this particular programme. Back to Olivia Blake, MP. And just a bit, going back to the codes um, and understanding what's happening on the ground, really, what does the code mean that the people are getting the hours that they need, or how will the department know that the, um, the parents are securing enough hours to meet their own needs? So the fact of a validation of a code doesn't tell us how many hours it's for, yeah. um, but we will get that through the termly headcount. Head okay. And we're also doing parent polling as well, is our other, um, to, to understand that exactly, uh, that point. Um, and how will you be able to tell through that as well whether government funded places are increasing their hours as well from that data? As in knowing whether a parent is just using the same number of hours. Yeah. yeah. So, so the 15 hours is, 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 was deliberately set at the rate that is lower than average usage, so we wouldn't expect to see a lot of growth out of the 15 hours, okay. uh, either April or September. It's the 30 hours that we believe will drive the, the increase yeah. in usage to, to drive the labour market impact that we're after. But our evaluations will be set up to do it, exactly that, to understand exactly what behaviour has changed. And they are looking at all phases of the rollout. Uh, our evaluation partners, so they will make an assessment of what what the impact of those at the different at the earlier phases of rollout as well as the final phase of rollout. How how will you be able to tell? Sorry, it, through the evaluation, it will, be, it will be surveying parents and understanding what okay. what has happened. Um, IFS are our are our partner for the um, impact evaluation, and um, they've got lots of plans for how they're going to evaluate this. Um, yeah, and do you know what proportion of the one hundred and ninety five? thousand dodd parents who secured government funded places in april um that were already using childcare. 
So, so we don't at this point okay. because the, the code doesn't it doesn't show whether it's a new parent or not. Yeah. Um, but we will we'll get more on that data as we understand where those children are and what and what they're being used, um, so that you can make that assessment of of, of the addition. When, when, when will we? When, when will we, we know that? that? <laughs> uh, the, the, we will publish the determinant headcount data later um, I can confirm when that's going to be but it, it will be we will we will publish the results of the term headcount data and I'll confirm what will be included there's in always that. a lag obviously in that so yeah. so when you you'll publish it later this year so it'll be after the summer term yes but maybe before within 20 the next roll, part of the rollout or I'll, I'll confirm yeah, that you'll know it before the next part of the rollout yes yeah. Okay, if you could confirm in writing the date, yeah, so we yeah. just like to keep hold of dates. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's quite, a key, quite a key statistic, I think. It's this. important, although it, it's worth saying that we did design this so that the first step, as, as Susie set out, we really consciously wanted to get all of the systems and processes set up around this and working mm. early mm -hmm. and to backload the part where we were asking providers to massively increase the number of places yeah. available. And so it's, it's by design. So we, I wouldn't expect to see a huge number of parents who weren't using childcare at all coming into the system through this April piece. Our design was that, this, yeah. that, that mm. April will start off being something that is partly about us starting to fund places which at the moment parents are having to pay for themselves mm. and there are also benefits yes. from that for parents for affordability as well as for the system yep. in terms of getting that geared up for the rollout later Thanks. so it's important but i wouldn't see it as a sort of Ms. Blake. Mm. Oh, that's all chair. Thanks. okay thank you um i just wanted to pick up on um well thank you to all those who gave evidence um, and and one of some of the evidence has highlighted these this issue about i suppose you could call it gaming it i mean there are lots of ways you can describe it where where providers start because of the worries about the subsidy not covering the costs, start charging for extras, uh, whether they strip up food or other activities. Um, how, how are you monitoring whether or not that is happening and what are you doing about it? Ms Owen, I guess. So we have issued clear guidance on what is what we what the funded hours cover. So we're really clear what that covers and what it doesn't. So it doesn't cover consumables. So that's meals, nappies, trips, additional activities um, that, that a provider might offer. Um, we're very clear with local authorities that that needs to be made clear to, to providers and that where um, additional charges are being made for those things, that there are uh, arrangements in place for parents to provide alternatives, pack lunch, for example, or supply their own uh, nappies. And we're very clear as well that... Um, uh, so basically, so a nursery couldn't start charging a lot of money for nappies. Uh, they, 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 if they did, the, the parent could provide themselves. Exactly. There needs to be an alternative. Yeah. To it needs to be voluntary. Effectively, yeah. it can't be. It can't be compulsory. Okay. Um, uh, so, so the part of what I, what I said earlier is being clear to parents as well what that means. Um, uh, so they understand what what, what the funded entitlements um, have, and therefore, if they have any concerns, um, they can raise that with their local authority, um, who can take it up with the provider, or depend on the agreements that the provider, the local authority has in, in, in place with the provider. But also, parents can also escalate that to the LA ombudsman, the local authority ombudsman, as well, if they have any concerns around around that practice. Okay, so they can't cross subsidise, but you're trying to stop that cross subsidy um, happening. Okay, um, and then um, one of the other concerns that's been raised in, in some of the evidence is about providers withdrawing, um, uh, and that that if the money isn't going to be enough to, to cover the costs, that there's a concern that, that that providers could be withdrawing. So how are you monitoring that, and how are you monitoring which ones would be withdrawing, whether it's the smaller ones, ones in deprived areas, which has been something that's been highlighted in the evidence as a concern. Is there any again? Yeah. So. Um, we, we um, it, it is voluntary, so we don't compel providers to offer this. Um, so it's up to a provider if they if they do it or not. We don't have powers to say you must you must offer this this provision. But we're very confident in the rates that we've set. Um, that they compare very favourably favourably to parent paid fees in the vast majority of cases, which means the, the strong incentive is there to, to provide it. And as we've already discussed from the, the, the results we've seen in April, um, high numbers of parents have been able to access those places. We have not heard reports of providers withdrawing. I think if we recall back to 20, uh, ahead of the 2017 rollout, there were many providers who said they wouldn't um, offer the hours. And ultimately, I think over 90% of providers did. Um, uh, and we expect to see, to see the same again, but, but, but that was what was so critical. That it comes back to some of your early questions about um, the pace and the, uh, 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 ensuring, managing some of the risk, but getting the rates at the right um, amount to incentivise providers to offer is, is absolutely key. Um, if the rates were not right, we would be seeing far higher numbers of providers uh, uh, not offering, and, and we're not, we're not and seeing The corollary is we saw a lot of providers, in fact, the National Day Nurseries Association highlights 
that uh, there are 502 fewer early years nurseries and preschools in August 23 than the previous year. That's not their figures, so I can't verify them. Don't, don't doubt that they're, they're, they're accurate. Um, so will you be monitoring of more places are opening and how? Yeah, absolutely. So Ofsted, uh, uh, obviously when you register, every earliest provider has to be registered with Ofsted. That's a way of us tracking places so we can we, we can get management information from them. Ofsted obviously publish their, that, that data on a on a, uh, a twice yearly basis and we, we conduct our annual survey which is our assessment of every provider including a school base because officers data doesn't include school based nurseries if it's twos and upwards um, uh, so that gives us a really good way of tracking um, what's happening and we that's where we've seen the place growth so even where we've seen provider numbers drop mm. place growth at the same time has has increased the majority of provider closures closures that we've seen in recent years has been childminders um, we've seen uh, the, the group based provision be pretty stable and, and growing uh, internal uh, MI implies it's going in the right direction and we hope to see more of that coming over I think that that data from August 2023 obviously was before any of the yes, investment exactly. had, had yeah. reached but, but, yeah. but that's like, yeah, there was less available and so you're hoping there might be more just and I just want to touch on on the issue about rural rurality and, and some geographical challenges which is being played out a bit in the report and but in some areas of the country where it's very rural you could have a, a few uh, you know, providers will be <laughs> further apart because of the nature or they could be 40 minutes the wrong way from somebody's workplace and these are long distances that people have to travel so what are you doing to make sure that parents in rural areas where there's sparse well, everything's a bit has sparser than it is in my own area um i get can really genuinely access it because childcare, you know as well as quality and price actually local to where people live or work is really important i mean it's difficult to completely control from uh, whitehall but what are you doing to, how are you taking that into account so that's when working with the local authority becomes really important and, and then really understanding where their potential sufficiency issues might be and what they're doing with it, that provider base to address that. It's often where school-based provision can, can be really helpful um, because of schools being most places. Um, uh, so so there, there's different ways of addressing it, but um, it would be working with the local authority. We also allow local authorities to apply a rurality supplement if that's needed in that area. So when we pass the money on to local authorities, they then set a local formula um, and they can apply a certain supplements, which include quality, disadvantage, and rurality, which can allow them to help, again, incentivise provision in those Does that areas. that mean that more rural areas get a bit more money so they can... can Not definitely, no. but the local authority can choose to do that. That's so within so their yeah, allocation, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, exactly, so yeah. if they have a fixed allocation and then they're able to allocate that according to rurality they're not getting any extra, any extra, extra money for it no it's out of their total pot of money that we provide to them we then set some rules that they can then set they have some flexibilities to. that's all very well but if, you re if it's just a rural area I mean I'm thinking of parts of Northumberland or North Yorkshire I mean you know there are you know, there are towns but they're not there, there will be quite a lot of need potentially in quite remote areas yeah. so that they're basically having to take a, a chunk out of the money they're getting to subsidise certain to, but we could have to subsidise all of their uh, suppliers. Yeah, so it will be that they, they, when they set their local rates, they will consult with their local provider base to decide to get that input about what the right way is. So some, some will, will choose not to use that and just allocate it out. We haven't seen any issues with rurality for April. Um, it's something that we do. We keep a really close eye on because we know it can be an issue. Um, we'll, we'll deploy our contracted childcare works to go and work with those. We'll also set up you know, sh sharing for those local authorities that have similar um, experiences and provide guidance, etc. Because to, 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 there's various ways around it. But it, it's something that we're very alive to because we recognise the risk, but the particular risk that might exist there. It's not something that we've seen a challenge with as yet, but it's something that we're keeping. Well, it's definitely, uh, definitely one to watch. I'm glad you're watching it. And then, then obviously a concern as well is where, where you've got um, or existing well-established. Uh, places which parents have been paying for that means parents have had the money to pay for it in certain deprived areas that's that's more challenging so how are you going to make sure that you're not going to see the deserts of care in deprived areas where and, and pro providers just go into the, the areas where they, they, they've got more working parents and more more clients more customers more so i think this is one area where actually the expansion will really really help so often the issue in deprived areas that is that um, providers have been more reliant on government funding and not able to set rates too high because parents in those areas can't given the rates that we're setting across all the age ranges if they are more dependent on government money that's a better position for them to be in the funding is more sustainable it's guaranteed etc so actually we think this will really help provision in disadvantaged areas and um, because we you know aside from what i what i said earlier about 
how, um, how local authorities um, allocate can make some changes to their local formula. We account for disadvantage when we issue out our formula so that, that, that the population needs is taken into account when we allocate that to local authorities and that means that they can you know, pay the same to a, a nursery in a deprived area as a, as a more affluent area. So it, it feels like more of a leveller in that perspective. So we think this is going to help those and, and really respond to some of those providers that have struggled in recent times to, to ensure their businesses have been sustainable. Before I pass uh, to Mr Walker, I mean, the, the, the challenge, you've, the government's set aim in this is to increase economic activity, so it's for working parents. Obviously, in, in certain deprived areas, um, it's for lots of reasons, it can be more challenging, especially if you're trying to juggle childcare costs. What measures are you putting in place to make sure that you are assessing with other departments the work activity increase in the poorest households? Um, as a direct result of this childcare intervention? That will form part of the evaluation to, to exactly look at that. We'll also monitor take up, obviously, as that goes through. We'll look at that by income di distribution to see if there are any trends that are emerging. The disadvantage two year old offer as well is, 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 is important. We have uh, given local authorities the ability to set a higher rate for that disadvantaged offer if they believe that's the right thing to do um, to ensure that we're not pushing out using working parent two-year-olds pushing out um, disadvantaged um, Just to be clear, so how would that work? So, if, so a deprived parent could get more within... So the, the, the provider goes, could get more for... So the budget could go, go to the council. They could give the provider more for the more, most disadvantaged parents and children. Does that So does that just mean less for uh, other places? Yes, yeah, so they will look at their two-year-old um, provider base and, and the percentage of disadvantaged two-year-olds taking up the disadvantaged element versus the working element, and they can choose to set a differential rate if they believe that will incentivise the right form of provision. So it's a local decision, again, um, to be made. But yes, out of their total pot, you're right. And in addition, we do give an early years pupil premium, so we do, yeah. we do also nationally give a little bit more for um, children. Just, it's interesting, so it'll be interesting to see how the variations in authorities shake down. Mm. Um, and I'm trying to compute the, the many, many options there, but I'm going to yeah. uh, pass back uh, to Mr. Walker. Thank you. I mean, just on this, uh, on this issue of the local authorities, we to get, when we took evidence from childminders in particular, I guess we talked about the, the rates that the government was setting out, and, and fundamentally they didn't believe us. Uh, and so um, they, 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 now when I look at the local rates being paid in my area, they are not as much as the government's rates. That's natural because um, you know, London does get more and other areas get less um, in, in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but is part of that drop off in childminders that you're talking about, which is continuing from what you're saying, um, that their businesses are becoming less sustainable in areas which are lower funded? And does that then affect the diversity of the offer that is there for parents? I don't think we're seeing that childminders are being particularly effective. And in fact, on average, they charge lower. They have historically charged lower fees, so they stand to gain more because the way we pay out is what we call provider blind. So we pay the same, or a local authority pays the same to a to a childminder as it does to a school or a nursery for for that age of child. Um, so so so, given that they are on average, they tend to charge lower fees, that, and they take often take younger children. They stand to to gain quite a lot from the from the introduction of the entitlement. So we haven't seen that that play out as yet, but obviously it's something that will. I, I do think this point about rate by age is quite important. So one of the things we've seen really clear, and sorry to, to do this in a little bit of detail, but one of the things we've seen really clearly is that group-based providers who operate across the whole of the age spectrum will typically try and charge relatively flat rates, so they're not kind of suddenly kind of... I mean, they don't want to take parents in with the very highest rate, even though it's more expensive to provide for the very youngest children. So if you look at the average parent-paid rate in 23-24, it was £6.05 and p for under twos, £6.07 and p for two-year-olds, and £5.90 for three- and four-year-olds, which is a really very flat profile. Mm -hmm. When you look at what it costs to provide, it's much more expensive than that to provide yeah, for the is. youngest children. And so a lot of providers are cross-subsidising their younger children from their older children. And I think there's a few things that flow from that. So the, the rates we're setting are much more generous for the younger children. So £11.22 for the under twos, £8.28 for two-year-olds, and then £5.88 for the three- and four-year-olds. And when you hear providers talk, they will worry about the three- and four-year-old rate. But I think that is partly because they're accustomed to setting a higher parent paid rate for those three and four year olds and then cross subsidising. Mm -hmm. So any provider that's operating across the full age spectrum will be doing better with these rates. And we've looked quite carefully, not just at that national parent paid rate, but at how the rates in local areas compare 
to the parent paid rates in local areas. And again, we see that our two-year-old and under two-year-old rates look really good compared to the parent paid rates in local areas. Okay. On childminders, yep. sorry, I think childminders have suffered a bit from the fact that they are particularly used for the youngest children. And so if they charge rates that don't involve a cross-subsidy across from older children, which is much harder for them to do because they've got fewer children yeah, and yeah, more of them are young, yeah, yeah. Yeah. they compare badly with nurseries. Under these rates, childminders looking after younger children will be in a much stronger position. I mean, I, I, we did hear quite a lot of evidence in our inquiry that the, um, of the opposite of what you've just been talking about in terms of people who were making a loss on the three- and four-year-old um, rate and cross-subsidising it with higher charges for two-year-olds. So I, I appreciate it's going to be a mixed picture, um, but I think there is, you know, the rates which have been set out at the central level from government do look attractive. The reality of how those translate through the local formula isn't always quite as attractive um, when it comes to, 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 to looking at these issues. Is there an expectation management issue there? around mm -hmm. being clear that the rate and the headline is not necessarily what providers will receive. Yes, exactly. I, think, I, think, I think there may be. I also think, so quite often people will, will quote the base rate locally and not take account of the fact that, so local, local authorities, both, there's both different rates locally and they can hold some back for supplements and give them differentially to different providers. And so quite often the headline rate quoted is not only different because it's local, it's different because they've taken all the supplements out of it so I do I mean we've been talking about this internally I do think there is some expectation management challenges and I think there's some clarity challenges straightforwardly but I also think we overwhelmingly providers have said they were pleasantly surprised by the two-year-old and under two rates and the and the pressure we're getting is more on the three and four-year-old rate and I do think we'll a we need to keep an eye on that but b I do think some of that will unwind as they see that that and again, our cost modelling is pretty clear, and the IFS have confirmed this: that the rate we've set for three and four-year-olds ought to enable profit to be made even for three and four-year-olds, because at the moment some of that is going to cross subsidy across the system. Olivia Blake, um, if I could just ask one question: I imagine some of this um, is going on uh, overheads of LAs, and I'm just wondering if you've done any evaluation of whether they have just using the same formula formula they've always used on a bigger number which might not actually be very good for nurseries at the end of it. We require them to pass through 95% of the total to providers so again they can hold some of that back as supplements and put it out differentially but it's got to go out to providers. Um, it is true that continuing to allow them to hold 5% means they're holding a larger total amount than they would have in the past if they choose to hold the whole of it, they don't have to. Mm. Um, and at the moment we have allowed that because we can see that there's significant costs for the local authority in standing up this new offer and doing the work on sufficiency and we want local authorities to be able to do that but again you you might think that would be something we would keep under review as we move towards a kind of mm. steady state so you you want local authorities to have capacity and capability to yeah. stand up the new offer once it stood up I think we would want to sort of pause and look with them at the continuing cost base for their central work. Right. And I think we have already announced actually that we will increase to 97% the Sorry, amount we expect to be to be expect to be okay. passed on next year. We haven't confirmed when we will. We said later in the rollout, but we have confirmed. Just that so, we so will. giving them time to bed in with five percent <coughs> exactly to, 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 to reduce to, their efforts. Exactly. Yeah, because that's the percentage terms. It's the same, but it's a big jump in a number, isn't it? I guess that's what I'm thinking. Um, just going to providers. Do you think that they have what they need to expand by the 85,000 places in the next 18 months? How confident are you that they'll be able to step up? Um, Mr Russell. So we've got, we've, we've got survey evidence from November where we asked providers about that appetite and expectation to expand, which suggests that we've got a, mm -hmm. something that's about in the right ballpark. One of the challenges of this system is that it... Providers will operate relatively just in time. So providers don't typically create a lot of empty places with a lot of people supervising and sort of then sit and wait for them to be filled. It's, it's, a, it's quite a fluid and quite a dynamic market, and that's one of the challenges uh, in um, doing a rollout of this kind. Uh, we, we do see, though, that because of that... They have to have premises, though. Yes. So. But the, and, and again, when you look at the kind of... So there are some places where capital and premises are a constraint. That's why we put £100 million of capital funding into the system and we've, we're working with local authorities on, on how they're using that. But um, 
typically people will tell us that and again the the school premises pilot that we're doing um typically they will tell us that the workforce is the thing they're more uh, overall more concerned about than the premises um although again it varies by provider of course um the the, the, the thing about that relative agility in the system is that we do see numbers move quite significantly over time. So, for example, uh, there are about 12,900 more um, people working in the early years sector this year than there were last year, and that's without any of the incentives that we've put in place or any of the work that we've done to try and generate that. So you can see quite significant movement in a relatively short time mm -hmm because they're accustomed to recruit when they have the need and, and the demand. Blake. I think that um, that all providers do want to expand, I guess is my question. What's the incentive for them to No, I don't think all do providers it. want to expand. I think the question is whether there are enough that want to expand in the right places to meet the yeah, need and whether we can identify the... So again, the, we've, we've got a very wide variation of additional need. You can see it, and I think you might be looking at the map in the NEA report that shows this. Mm. So there are some places where even for September 2025, the net gain in capacity needed is zero or close to zero because of the capacity that's mm. already there in the system. And then we've got other places where there's a much, much more significant need. So a lot of this is about that kind of really detailed local work that Susie has been describing yeah. with local authorities to make sure we can identify the places where we need to see the most significant growth that we understand with the local authority what the provider landscape is like and then that we've got the incentives right and the setting of the funding rates at a level that make it worth people's while is the mo the single most critical intervention because um, that generates both the funding to pay people and the incentive for the provider to be interested in the expansion. And just to say that the when we consulted with providers after last year's spring budget about what would give them the confidence to expand, the number one thing they asked for was certainty about future uprating of the rates that we offer. So in the spring budget of this year, the Chancellor was able to give them some reassurance that we will use a formula for uprating these rates, uh, at least over the next couple of years, that does take account of, of their cost base. Okay. Um, interesting that you mentioned the map because... Sheffield was on that map, and it's, it's unfortunately 20.1% to 30% yeah. increase in childcare hours required around there. Um, so I, w I wonder, um, with a Sheffield hat on, what else that you're considering to do uh, to help support growth in areas like Sheffield, um, where it's clearly needed? Um, Mr Russell, do you have any other... Well, I, I think it's, it's a mixture of all of the things that we've been talking okay. about. So it's the reassurance to providers about the rates that will be offered. Uh, it's the work that we've been doing to support them with the physical capacity that they may need to uh, expand. And we've made an investment in the capital. Uh, um, is there anything in the back pocket is basically what I'm asking. Is, is there any contingency ideas that you've got in I mean, case just, this just doesn't work. In terms of workforce, for example, one of the things yeah. we're exploring at the moment is if we if we offer people a financial incentive to come back into the uh, into the childcare market, whether that will encourage increased uh, recruitment. And we've got 20 pilot areas where we're planting that, and we'll robustly compare that to some pilot areas to see whether, yes, that does <coughs> increase it. So I think th those particular concerns about <coughs> workforce, I think, where the most potential to uh, act on. And where you've got the most, um, well, the biggest hill to climb, I suppose, on places, is there anything in particular you're doing regionally? Yeah, so we, again, I might bring Susie in to talk about this, but what we do is we, we, we start from that assessment of supply and demand that we've got, and again, that goes below the levels shown in the map down to ward level, and we look at that regularly with each local authority, both looking at what's needed. So, again, we have been looking at them with what, about what's needed for April, then September, and then the following September. And um, we triangulate the understanding from our data with their kind of local understanding and make sure that we've got a kind of common picture. And then we have a system for... Um, based not just on that kind of number but on the local authority's own assessment of mm. how comfortable it is with its own plan because we don't want to go kind of uh, fundamentally there are many many local authorities that have really good quality plans and are themselves confident about their delivery so we take that into account as well and then we effectively have a kind of a, a staged um, 
uh, set of support that we can offer. So we, w we offer more intensive to support to those local authorities that either have the biggest mountain to climb or are telling us that they are worried about climbing it or both. Mm. Uh, and then we stage the support down through those that... So there's a, a group, from, for example, for September 2025, yes. who are saying... As it were, we are neither confident nor unconfident. It's too far out. We don't know yet. And with those, we have a package of work that's about helping them understand it better so that we can get underneath that. And then for those that are confident, we do a much lighter touch process of staying in touch with them and checking, again, a bit of checking that their confidence is justified, frankly, um, and a bit of work to, to just stay in touch with them and make sure that they continue to be confident continued sharing of the numbers as they change and so on and we have a delivery partner working with us called Child Care Works um, who have also worked with us on uh, the HAF program which is another program which, that has a lot of the similar characteristics in that it's working with a very large and dispersed group of providers through local authorities and depended heavily on bringing people together in order to um, stand up that work and childcare works have a set of kind of packages that they can offer to local authorities again tailored to to the yeah. both to the size of the challenge and indeed to the nature of the challenge so again different authorities will tell us different things about what their worry is so whether it's an overall sufficiency worry or whether broadly speaking mm. they think they've got enough places but not in the right places again whether it's capital or workforce yeah. that they're most concerned okay. about um, just finally for me how confident are you that um the recent increases that have been there will continue to be an incentive to providers to expand. Like so, you said that they need that as reassurance yes. to do the current expansion, but how is so it? As I say, forward? this is something we need to keep really close to okay. providers on. We do we keep doing the assessment of how the rates compare with the parent paid rates and the parent paid rates aren't magic, but they are quite a strong indication of what of, of kind of the market signal for what is going to make a difference. Um, and we also are looking at what providers tell us about their future intentions and the kind of whys behind them. So if they're not proposing to expand, we ask them why not and try and understand that. And we also look at things like their intentions in terms of uh, whether they will pass the increased rates through into pay or take them as profit, on which about 77% of providers say they intend to pass them through into pay and about 5% say that they, um, at least to some extent, Proposed to make themselves more profitable. And again, profit is not a you know small amount of profit is not a bad thing. It's an incentive to, to work. But that feels like not a bad ratio mm. based on the latest intelligence. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Uh, Olivia, Ol oh, sorry, <laughs> Sarah, only <Olney>, MP. <laughs> You're rechristened. Um, I want to talk about workforce, which I feel mm. is very much dare mm. I say the elephant in the room at the moment because uh, certainly it feels as if the biggest, most significant challenge mm. around expansion of childcare places is staffing in, in childcare settings. Um, and I wanted just to, to touch briefly on a conversation I had with a constituent recently who runs a nursery in South London. Um, and the thing that she really wanted to highlight with me is the new um, salary threshold for visas as is being set at 31,000. There's um, exemptions for those working in health and social care, but not for those working in, uh, in education or in childcare settings. And the 31,000 threshold she told me, is it's really much too high. That's a kind of management level salary uh, in, in childcare. Mm. Uh, and the kind of staff that she needs to recruit, and given this is a, um, a, a London nursery, are, are below that level. Um, and she particularly runs a Montessori nursery and they have a very specific kind of requirements. And she's really struggling for staff because she can no longer bring people in from abroad because they won't meet the salary threshold. So I just wanted to start just by asking, have, are there any? Uh, are you making any kind of representations to the Home Office around the particular staffing challenges in childcare uh, in relation to this salary threshold? Thank you. Um, I have to say the the visa thresholds for early years haven't been a particularly strong feature of the feedback that we've been okay. getting. Although I'm really happy to take that away and have a look at yep. it. So again, I don't. I don't. I can completely see why that would be for a Montessori nursery, but I think it's slightly in London, less, dare I say. In particularly in London. <laughs> yeah. I think it's slightly less common across the sector that people are trying to recruit. Okay. That's interesting. Um, and the other thing that she raised with me is that, um, uh, and I know this very much from my own experience, that the uh, early years childcare workforce is predominantly younger women, or mm -hmm. disproportionately, shall I say, younger women. Um, and that younger women often go off for maternity leave. And in her experience, 
Ironically, because they can't afford childcare, they then don't return. And I did wonder, thinking, you know, obviously you've got a range of sort of um, initiatives, I'll come on to this in a minute, uh, in terms of trying to attract more people into the sector. And I just wondered if you considered this particular sort of demographic um, and whether, what you might be doing to, to look at attracting men and older age groups into the workforce uh, in particular to kind of counteract, as I say, that disproportionate, um, you know, younger women focus. Yes, I mean, you're right. It is a disproportionately female workforce. And if you look at the um, uh, the campaign that we've been running, uh, Do Something Big, Work With Small Children, you'll see that that kind of quite deliberately uses a range of different... Um, role models to try and make sure we're, we, are, when we are expanding the kind of um, uh, people we can attract. And we've seen some of the kind of... We, we've seen um, some providers that have done some really creative things to try and bring a different demographic into the workforce. I mean, the, the, the only thing I would, other thing I would say on that is it is because it has been a sector for a long time that has that profile, um, there are some reasonably kind of tried and tested ways of... Um, managing things like maternity leave return as quite a lot of nurseries will make a virtue of the fact that they can support child care themselves for their workforce and I don't know if you've heard there's an amazing new child care offer for working parents that I think might help with this as well <laughs> um, uh, so I think um, I, I think there are a number of things that we can do around that both on the attraction and on the support for the people in the workforce um, Thank you and I was really struck um, by the the de- decrease in the number of childminders between 2018 and 2023, mm. the report says 35%. And I just wondered if you know what's driving that reduction in childminders. It's such a critical part of the sector uh, for so many parents. It feels, it feels like a lot. <laughs> yes, and it's been, a, it's, it's been a relatively sustained decline and something that we've been looking at over quite a long period. As I say, I'd, I'd, I do think some of that kind of rate cross-subsidy point that I described earlier may be playing a role. I think some of it is around um, changing parental patterns and parental choice, but I think childminding remains an incredibly important component of the system. It often offers more flexibility to parents, and there's a set of things that we, we've been doing to try and incentivise um, more people to come back into child binding. So both thinking about that as we do things across the whole system like set the rates, we've we've um, uh, we've created a, a child mind a specific version of the early years and foundation stage documentation that really focuses on things that only they have to do, which simplifies for them. We've also got um, uh, uh, child minding incentives running. Titi, do you want to just talk a bit more about what we're doing child minding? So yes, we've got a grant grant scheme open, um, which uh, provides either um, uh, five hundred or um, one thousand pounds to new childminders, depending if they're registered with Ofsted or with a childminder agency, and that is um, to uh, cover the costs of registration, which can be quite a big outlay for for childminders when they're thinking of entering in. So that's operational at the moment; it runs through till through till next year. And as the the, the recruitment campaign that um, uh, Susan also mentioned, the do something big work with small children will have a childminder component to it because actually it can be a really attractive option um, for for people if they have the right housing etc to, to move in I think there's a there's a child minder consultation out at the moment looking at additional flexibilities that we can provide to child minders to help them we've done a lot of work with Ofsted to smooth the registration process and we've brought that <coughs> down now I think it's an average of 10 weeks it's taking um, uh, to, 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 to um, register which we know is also can be a barrier the length of time it can take um, so there's various things we're looking at to, to take the friction out, out of the system um, and to, to ensure that people understand that it's a really attractive um, uh, proposition. Also, the comms to parents is really important, explaining what childminders are, what they do. Um, uh, we, we, we do think that it, it's possible that this uh, having more younger children into the childcare um, uh, sector means that parents... You know, they like a childminder environment often often for their youngest children. They like they feel feel more comfortable putting a, a child into a childminder's home maybe than rather than a, a larger nursery. So ensuring that parents know the choices are out there and the demand yeah. is there, I think also will, will help. Ms. Olney. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ackland, when will you know whether the early years section will have enough staff for your September 24 and September 25 rollouts? <clears throat> so... For September 2024, we need about an uh, an 8,800 uh, increase. Sorry, I'll just find another. Um, 
and that is less than the increase that we saw in 2023, as I say, without any of the incentives that we're describing. So um, the increase for September 2024, uh, I think, should be kind of relatively readily manageable. That's 15,500. Um, sorry? 15,500. Um, I think it's eight and a half thousand. I think it's fifteen. Is that I think that's that's places a rather than oh, right. okay. yeah. people. So I think it's fifteen and a half thousand places. Eight and a half. Forgive me. Eight and a half thousand. Yep. Stop. Sorry. sorry miss, Got yeah. me worried then. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> Keep me on your toes. Um, <laughs> the the um, uh, and then for September twenty twenty five, it is a, it's a much more significant step up. And I think, as I described earlier, the real challenge is that we would not expect that to kind of grow over the course of the year between September twenty twenty four and twenty twenty five, because typically people don't put people in in advance of the need. So the challenge we've got is we will have. Um, so at the moment, our workforce information comes from an annual census. We're doing a set of pulse surveys with providers which give us more regular information. We're stepping up the frequency of those and we will get much more regular information over the course of next year. But we still expect to see quite a big ski jump in the um, in the numbers as we get very close to that kind of moment. And so a part of this is about making sure we've got the, the pipelines through that the so some of those early indicators we've got like the number of applicants per vacancy which again encouragingly we did see go up in the last set of pulse surveys from about two um, applicants per vacancy to about five um, and the interest that we're seeing coming through the campaign as well as through our skills routes we need to build that kind of pipeline and make sure that's there and ready for the flexibility yeah. that, that provides lots only and what do you think of the interventions that the DfE can make, what do you think are the ones that are most effective in terms of building that pipeline? So, I actually continue to think that the single most effective intervention is about the setting of a of a of a good economic rate, which allows um, uh, pay rates to be set at a level where people can be attracted. Because we see we, we've actually got rather a large pool of people with childcare qualifications in the labour market but not necessarily currently working in childcare. So we, we, we see rather a large group of people who enter childcare qualifications, particularly coming out of school, but don't all go on to work in the childcare sector. So there are a set of things we can do on the skills side and indeed we're increasing the funding rate for uh, childcare apprenticeship places, we're making sure the levelling up premium is available to FE teachers who teach childcare courses, we've got significant growth in T levels, we've got really, uh, we're providing childcare skills boot camps, about 2,800 2, places which are, and again, those are already running. Um, but uh, a chunk of this is about making sure that we translate those trained people into people who are actually working in the sector. So although I think all of those things are important, the critical things are around um, uh, the rates, the pay, and actually some of the things around attractiveness and prestige to people. And that we, we are seeing some quite encouraging early figures coming through so both in terms of sort of clicks yep. through to job adverts from our from our advert, but also people's perceptions of working in the sector, which again will be an important driver. Zolny. So it seems to be almost like a bit of a mismatch. You know, the report saying only about a quarter of those who start relevant qualifications then go on to work in the sector, but you've actually got quite a few people already working in the sector who don't have the right kind of qualifications. Um, but I just wanted to quickly ask... Um, uh, um, just about the, you, you mentioned there's sort of a census. What else are you doing to collect the right sort of data that you need um, to uh, to monitor you know, workforce shortages and, and 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 the success of initiatives to address that? And and are you and what are you doing to kind of like uh, drill down regionally and nationally in terms of that that data? So the. The censuses in the Pulse survey are important and they ask a set of questions of providers both about their workforce and, as I say, about some of these things like applicants per, per place. Um, we've also got some work going on with some of our kind of largest providers where we're working with them on kind of more real-time information about what they're seeing coming through the workforce. Um, and uh, we're also exploring other routes, including... Um, real-time information from HMRC. Um, and finally, um, obviously you think that the, the biggest part of the, of the jigsaw here is to be increasing the rates uh, yes. so that uh, providers are able to offer a more competitive uh, uh, salary. 
Um, but to what extent will the um, sort of the, the, the increased rates go to sort of address previous underfunding? How can you be certain that that's going to feed through into a better offer for those entering the workforce now? So as I say, when we survey providers, about 77% of them say that they expect to pass rates through into pay. Um, we also, um, again, some of this is about the sh that shape of the rate that I described earlier. So the incentive to make sure that providers are interested in providing places for the younger children that will make up the largest part of the growth that we see um, in the rollout. So in the past, that kind of, that pattern has not necessarily, and again, when you talk both to school-based providers and to others, they've been cautious about expanding down the age range uh, and setting the rates to make that attractive is an important part of the framing and shaping of the offer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mary Wimmer MP. Um, yes, I'm particularly interested in what support is afforded to local authorities who are charged with delivering this mm -hmm. responsibility. And I'm um, pleased to see the six weekly meetings mm -hmm. and more frequently with those that get more of demand. Um, how successful have you been these meetings? Um, and I know that oh. you provided a contractor to facilitate yes. and I've offered advice. What kind of advice? And what? So I'll, I'll bring Susie in in a minute. And what we might have to do is give some examples because it's very, yeah, it's, 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 really, it's really dependent on what the challenge is. So uh, yeah, I mean, so examples, the, please, yeah. the headline I'd say is I think it's been quite successful so far in the sense that we've, you know, we're, we're pleased with the work we've done on the April rollout. But do you want to just give a couple of examples so, perhaps? Yeah, sure. So there was a local authority, well, there was a provider um, in the east of England that went out of business early in, in January, um, uh, and so that obviously was a cause for concern, and they ran a number of settings. So in that instance, we would we would reach out to the local authority. speak up, please? Yeah. Sorry, of course. You can speak slowly and clearly. <laughs> for the loop. I've speeded up. <laughs> yeah. I've gone yeah. through. Um, there was a provider um, who went out of business earlier in the year, so ahead of the, the April rollout that was operating across a number of local authorities in a particular region. So in that instance, we reached out to that local each local authority and understand what the impact has been um, and what might need to be done. In that case, every local authority was able to assure ourselves that they knew it, they had good relationships with other providers, they had placed those children and that it didn't then turn into a sufficiency concern. So that's an example of where something very specific happens um, and we, we, we work closely uh, with them to do that. Um, there might be issues with local authorities where they don't have a, a, a good enough handle on their supply and demand data, so what we talked about earlier. In that instance, we would, we would ask our, our childcare works providers to go in, help them with that mapping. They would take our data, obviously we share that with them, but what we're really keen that they do is make sure that our data matches what's happening on the ground in their local area, so it might be a, a process that, of... That's coming in useful. Yes, exactly. That can yeah. be really, really helpful for, for local authorities to, hand, to, to put a handle on that. Sometimes it's around the support that the local um, authority is able to provide to the businesses. So this is a big shift to business models. Um, uh, there's a lot of range of providers out there, very small single site providers, childminders, as well as obviously the larger group based settings. So again, what our contractor will do is go in and, and help advise on business models, how to communicate um, with providers to think about the way that they structure their business in order to make sure that they are taking account of the rates across the different ages, what that means for how they sell those hours out into the market. So it can be very practical things as well like that, which is providing business, business support. We also do that sort of thing on a national level. So we provide um, uh, both ourselves and via our contractor webinars, um, uh, guidance, tools um, that, that address the common themes that we see coming up that, that might be challenging for, for, um, for a local authority in terms of how they, they work with their provider base. So it's it's, it's a range of things. There are obviously common themes across local authorities, but sometimes there are very specific issues like the one I described um, where you need to take a more tailored approach to, to what's happening. Are the local it's authorities really... more confident now in meeting the September 24 targets? Yeah. They are more confident. Yep, so we, we, um, we have a weekly meeting where we go through um, every local authority and look at where they are and whether they, that, that, that 
the, the intervention that we've put in place needs escalating or, or de-escalating. Um, within the last two weeks, I know the team has spoken to over, over 80 local authorities um, uh, to keep, so we keep in really close contact and we're constantly monitoring um, what might be required. Often it's a quite a small thing, um, and, it, and, and f from our perspective, we want to be really assured that they, when they say they're confident, they are confident. What are their plans? We ask to see those plans. And where there's issues, as I say, we, we, we go in and, and provide support. So we're looking at that on a weekly basis. We expect confidence to, to grow as we move towards September. That's what happened in for the April rollout. Um, uh, when we did the readiness assessment ahead of that, the confidence was much lower. But as we've seen, um, uh, all, all local authorities were able to deliver. And we expect that trend to repeat for, for September. But we, we don't take it for granted. We stay very, very close to those local authorities and to, to identify what the issues might be. And what about the number of spaces? Will, will they be there in time? 24 September. So that's what we would ask them. So where so many local authorities don't don't need don't need growth for September. They already have capacity in their system. Others do. Where, where they do need growth, we ask them to share the plans of exactly where that growth is coming from, how they're working with their local provider base, so so they know. And if they don't know, that would be a red flag for us, where we'd say, okay, we need to come You're in, in there in there to support. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. So it's that level of of information that we're seeking and asking from local authorities to assure ourselves that those places will be available. I just need to warn everyone, votes are expected shortly, so we'll just need to keep Sorry. up the, the pace. We've got the 100 million that's booked, it's expected much more capital grant will be needed. Um, how do we know when this is going to happen? The, the 100 million has been allocated out, so we yes. published the allocations back in the autumn, and we uh, the money went out to local authorities in um, February, I think it was. Um, Local authorities will be submitting their plans to us very shortly about how they intend to spend that money. And there'll be a variety of different things that they'll they'll do to use it. For example, we know one local authority is working with their schools to provide provision on the site in an area where there's, there's, there is there um, is low childcare availability, so they're getting a, a school to the extend DfE provision. The DfE is confident it's going to be able to fund the local authorities for any cost incurred. Yeah, we've already paid out this year um, 12 million in delivery support grants to local authorities to help them get ahead um, of that set up. And as uh, the Prime Secretary already described, we allow um, local authorities to hold back 5% of the overall funding to enable them to, to deliver the expansion. So we're confident there is enough money going in to support local authorities. But again, if we have any concerns about capacity, that's where we'll step in and work with that local authority to address uh, any capacity concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rimmer. It's Robin Walker. Uh, thank you. I was very struck by what you were saying earlier, both um, Justin and Susan, about um, special educational needs and um, the benefits of early mm. intervention in that space. I mean, I think it was one of the clear findings we heard in our inquiry about the benefits in this space. How do we ensure that um, the funding rates that you are providing don't incentivise providers to expand their capacity to meet these needs rather than needs of children with SEND, mm. when the benefits of meeting the needs of children with SEND are so enormous? Mr. Oh, Mr. I, might, Mr. I might bring just in a minute. I mean, the, the first thing I say is... I think, just bearing in mind time, we, yes. just, we don't need two answers, just to, you know, just to be really clear. Just Mr. Russell, thank you. Um, I mean, just, just to say, I, th I think Susan said earlier on that there are actually record numbers of children with a special need in an earlier setting. Now it's over 100,000 children with identified special mm. need are in a funded place already, and that's before we've moved to expand uh, entitlement, and that includes 15,000 children with a, with a education and health care plan, the existing funding formula does recognise the needs of children with special needs as well as children with disadvantaged backgrounds, so that's weighted into the funding formula. And there are also dedicated funding streams that go to providers to meet the needs of particular children. There's a disability access fund that goes to providers for children who are on DLA for children. And then we've, we fund a range of other activity like short breaks funding. So there are mechanisms within the funding system to recognise the mm. additional needs of those children. There's also a requirement on every local authority to set up a special uh, in educational needs inclusion fund. It's left to local authorities how big that fund should be, but they all have to have one and they have to report on how they're doing that. And they have to report to their local councillors on an annual basis as to how they're beating the sufficiency need for early years, which has to also include recognising the needs of SEND. Uh, and in terms of identifying children, that sufficiency need, sorry? in terms of identifying that sufficiency need, are you comfortable that local authorities have sufficient access to specialist assessment centres? Um, yeah, I had raised a situation before in Parliament where my local authority closed down the only specialist assessment centre in South Worcestershire because of needing to provide more places in primary for special needs children. Now, 
I'm told they're in the process of recommissioning one. Um, but if you don't have that expertise available in a local authority area, how are they identifying the children who need that extra support? Absolutely. Well, I think start, staff in, in early years settings are starting to identify themselves anywhere. I mentioned around about two years old, developmental delay starts to become identified. Health visitors do a really important two and a half year health check. So that's another avenue through which children will be identified. We are investing in the recruitment of educational psychologists, 400 more educational psychologists, and that's been very heavily oversubscribed, a lot of interest in taking up those uh, training opportunities. But I think we recognise, yeah, that a particular need for those specialist staff, whether that's educational psychologists or speech and language estimate experts. Uh, and, and, and I welcome that, and there's some very <coughs> welcome investment going into expanding both of those areas, which are really important for early intervention. But just... I'm concerned that if you don't have a network of specialist assessment centres that cover the entire country effectively, you, you will miss important elements of need here, which, if they're addressed, could help children then to engage successfully in their educational journey in mainstream schools. So um, is there more that the department could do to get oversight of the provision of SACs, where they are and where they aren't, uh, and how those gaps need to be filled? I mean, at the moment, we don't... We, we, we don't make a set of requirements on how local authorities do that kind of early assessment. But I think this, the, the, the kind of wider point about um, consistency and good practice in SEND more generally is a really important part of the SEND Improvement Plan and Change Programme. And one of the things that we are proposing as part of that is a set of clearer national standards which say what good looks like. And that would cover both looking at um, really good practice in mainstream provision, including in early years mainstream provision, which goes to kind of how everybody can get better at trying to identify needs. But I think we will also look really hard at the evidence around what good practice looks like on things like specialist assessments. And we might well be able to do something through that mechanism, again, depending a bit on what the evidence base shows us about what really works, mm. to, make a, to, to set out some clearer standards from the centre about what what good looks like. So I'd, I'd see that as part of that wider piece because at the moment we run a system <coughs> which we really do leave it to local authorities to organise their provision. And there are advantages to that because they can respond to local need. But we one, of the, right. one of the propositions that we put in the, in the reform package was that we could probably do a bit more to make sure we're spreading known good practice across the and, system. And, and just on capital, you mentioned the 100 million yeah. fund. Is any of that specifically targeted to meeting special educational needs? I haven't ring-fenced any of it for special education needs, but I would, be, I would be really surprised if we didn't see local authorities choose to use at least some of it in that way, given what, what we're asking them to do on understanding the profile of their need. And, and you mentioned, obviously, the, the, the funding rates that are over SENIF funding and the early years people premium to target support to disadvantaged mm -hmm. pupils within those. My understanding is that those haven't seen inflationary increases over a number of years. Um, so it, aren't they really becoming less valuable in real terms? And given the complexity of special educational needs, uh, is there not a need to, to, to review some of those to take account of that situation in which there are 100,000 children? You know, 15,000 within with EHCP, I suspect, is probably a lot higher than it was five or six years ago. We have increased EYPP and DAF um, Disability Access Fund, so that's a payment that goes to the child if they're, they're in receipt of a... a, a uh, uh, um, EHC plan or, or DLA, sorry. Um, so they have seen increases. We can confirm. I don't have the figures to hear, but I can confirm uh, what, what those are. But we have increased those in line with the with the uplifter rates uh, in recent years. Okay, no, that, 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 that's that's helpful. Um, are you measuring the impact of the, the rollout on the attainment gap? Um, one of the consistent issues that I've had raised with me since COVID is the number of children who suffered as a result of not being in some form of setting, some form of stimulation uh, during the period that they were that, that, that they were out of education. Uh, are, you, are you measuring, particularly given that previously for two-year-olds we only had an offer for disadvantaged children, um, whether that attainment gap is changing over time as a result of this rollout? Yes, we absolutely will be. And I think, I mean, one of the things, thank you for asking the question, one of the things I want to push back on a bit is some of that so I think it's a, it's a really important thing for us to um, monitor. When we look at children with a good level of development in the early years and foundation stage uh, last year compared to the year before, we can see not just that the headline rate for all children has gone up by two percentage points, but that the rate for disadvantaged children has gone up by two and a half percentage points, so the gap has closed a little bit in the last year, which we were really encouraged to see. But 
I do, some of the commentary sort of suggests that almost by its very nature, expanding provision must be going to make quality worse or risk mm -hmm. outcomes. And I think it's worth saying that that's not what we saw through the expansion, for example, of the three and four year old offer. We saw the ability to increase the amount provided and we continued to see improvement in both in Ofsted ratings of providers and coming through the um, uh, early years and foundation stage results. And that, that is what we, of course, is what we're uh, aspiring to and measuring ourselves against, that we can increase numbers and continue to hold really high quality and outcomes for children. And, and, and lastly, just obviously parental engagement with this will change over time. Um, you, you, you're seeing a very, very substantial expansion in the coming years. Um, have you looked at the what-ifs and how affordable the entitlements are if more parents than expected to take up the offers, and how do you mitigate against, against that uh, in terms of the affordability, the value for money of the whole proposition? So um, we've got quite good survey data on par par parental intentions at the moment, which we have obviously fed into our assumptions about take-up. But by and large, because this is a working parent offer, um, if we see significantly higher take-up than we're expecting, there's a point where that can only be true if we're seeing more parents entering the labour market or increasing their hours. And if that happens, then there's upside to the increase to take-up. In other words, our, so our our benefits cost ratio is 1 to 1.26, and that's on the basis of relatively conservative assumptions about the labour market impact. If we see much higher take-up than we expect, that's highly likely to be accompanied by better labour market outcomes. So we might be spending more, but we'll be gaining even more. The Treasury then comes up with the goods. Treasury are quite supportive of this policy. Mm -hmm. I think, I think uh, given the political landscape with every party competing to grow the economy, uh, if, if, if this works, then, you know, then everyone's going to be on board. Mr. Wattwarm, an MP, uh, th back. Thank, thank you, Chair, and apologies for dipping in and out. Um, you, you mentioned that the take-up, and obviously it does affect the value for money, but it will affect the quality as those uh, entitlements expand and as more and more people take them up. And if they are if your expectations are outperformed, for, for want of a better word, you are presumably going to have an even greater tension with making sure quality is maintained. How, how are you going to measure that, and how are you going to uh, try and make sure that it doesn't dip if you start to come up against your own, the top of your own expectations? Exactly. Yeah, so I, 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 I'll continue to push back a bit on the thought that there's a kind of a, a, a kind of inherent and automatic relationship between scale and quality. As I say, that's not what we've seen in the rollout of earlier entitlements. We've been able to expand uh, at, at large scale and, and maintain quality. And some of this goes. Sorry to keep going back to it. Some of that goes back again to the rate set, what we're able to pass through in terms of pay, but also to making sure that we're being really um, serious and intent with providers about the standards that we're setting. I mean, the one thing that I would say is this is a landscape that is populated, and in, and in a way this is both a sort of joy and some of the challenge of, of operating a relative of this kind. This is a landscape that is populated much more by people who really want to look after children well and care about their outcomes than it is by people who sort of rapaciously want to make a huge pile of money. Um, and, and that is one of the reasons Great. why... Yeah. why we do acknowledge. I'm sorry, just I'm aware there's a vote, so we can <laughs> extemporise on that for a long time, and we all agree the people, most of the people who do this are great. Yeah. Um, Mr. Woman, sorry, just okay. wait, I'm aware there's a vote coming. And, 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 and just just finally on on the related point of it, that 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 uh, take up goes up, you will then hopefully see more more and more parents going back into work, as yes. as you said. Um, how are you going in practice? How are you going to monitor that? And 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 isn't isn't it sort of it, it is a little bit. Uh, you're trying to measure something that uh, you're both measuring what you can see happening and yeah. what people say they might have done in different circumstances. Yeah. There are just lots of unknowns there. What does that look like in measuring terms? Yes, so it is a bit of a challenge because there is a little bit of kind of what would the counterfactual be and mm. some of the labour market outcomes will be about the labour market rather than about what, what you see in, in childcare. We, do a com we can do a combination of... Um, uh, straight kind of ONS and HMRC driven labour market outcomes. So we can look at change over time and again that's not completely proof against there being kind of other significant changes in the labour market at the same time. <coughs> but for example in our um, in, in international comparisons we actually have a relatively high rate of work among our <coughs> mothers in the UK but we have a much much higher rate of part-time work and a much lower rate yes. of full-time work 
uh, than other OECD countries. So you might, for example, look at whether that gap is closing, and that might well signal something that is more about this policy and less about the wider labour market. So you can look at mothers of children of the relevant ages outcomes as distinct from others in the labour market. And we will also continue to use survey evidence. So, for example, we can go back to the 30 hours rollout We've got about 50% of the parents uh, who benefited from that who we surveyed reporting that without 30 hours they'd be working fewer hours or not at all. And if that metric doesn't change, given that that's that's the one you've given us as an example, what what might you be able to try and do to make some further progress? So I think if we didn't see any change in... um, labour market participation and we'd be wanting to work really hard with parents who are taking up the offer to understand why not why not yeah okay. Okay. a lot of it's about logistics as a every working parent around the table <laughs> knows as well um look, we, we, we would we could carry on this discussion a lot longer but we're delighted that we our sister select committee is is also uh, looking at this and we will come back to visit this at some point in fact we may give you the excitement of a recall in september when we have some of these figures uh <laughs> Um, uh, that tell us how well the first phase has gone because there's obviously a very big interest out there and once again can I thank the people who wrote in with evidence because it really does help to enrich our work um, and those um, of our, our witnesses so thank you to Susie Owen a very good first time witness if I may say thank you to Susan Ackingford the Permanent Secretary and to Justin Russell the transcript of this session will be available on the website uncorrected in the next couple of days and we will be producing a report uh, likely now after the Whitson recess uh, but can I thank you very much indeed for your time order order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has